Um, so, civic technology, uh, solution or not? As with all things, uh, I think it depends what the problem is. Um, I think many of us uh, are here today because we, you know, a wonderful inspirational conference. I think we're here today because we see something wrong uh, with our democracies. We see something quite wrong with the way that our politicians, our institutions uh, communicate with us. I think even though a lot of us live in democracies, we, we see something wrong with the way that those democracies are currently operating. So I think the internet is great. I love the internet. I love Facebook. I love Twitter. Uh, I love the fact that even though the internet is one of the greatest inventions of mankind, that we've managed to absolutely cram it full of delightful gifts of cats and animals doing ridiculous things. But I think most of us here see the internet as a bit more of a noble tool. It can be used in a more noble way, uh, rather than just using it to discuss the latest episode of Game of Thrones with random strangers from around the world, we actually see the internet's potential to, to kind of harness uh, people power to, to fight back against what we see as injustice. Uh, and that's where civic tech comes in. Now, civic tech is one of those kind of slippery kind of things. It's probably better described by what it's not than what it is. Uh, it's not commercial. You know, it's, it's not a for-profit venture. Um, it's not really led by government, even though we have things like e-government, even though we have great initiatives now that are trying to bring governments and tech closer together. It's, civic tech normally sits outside of government. And it's not really social. It's not really social media in the kind of very narrow sense of what we think of when we talk about Facebook or Twitter. Uh, civic, te civic tech is that kind of digital space between government and citizen. Uh, it's a space that can encompass lots of digital tools that are supposed to enable participation, that, that are supposed to help people uh, engage them in politics, in government, in, in everyday civic life. And we have quite a lot of assumptions about civic tech. You know, I'm from my society. We are one of the first civic tech organizations in the world. Um, and these are, these are kind of our assumptions, you know. We, we believe that civic tech is built to do good. Uh, we believe that civic tech makes democracy easier to access. We believe that our tools help create better communities. You know, we believe that if you use these tools, you're not only making a contribution online, it's having a tangible offline benefit, not just for you, but maybe for other people in your community as well. We build interfaces that are supposed to be easy for everyone to use, and that's really important. You know, civic tech is supposed to be for everyone. Civic tech is supposed to enhance democracy for everyone, not just those people who are educated, not just those people that have the latest iPhone. Uh, civic tech is supposed to be for everyone, and if we want it as a tool to make democracy better, it needs to be accessible to everyone. But is it? Is civic tech a kind of golden solution? Is, is civic tech something that is going to be a solution for everyone? Um, maybe. I like, I'm from my society, so maybe I should just say yes and, uh, and leave it at that. Um, but I think to answer that question, you know, to, to answer the question whether civic tech can really be a solution, the first thing we need to do is actually understand who we're even talking about, you know, who, who is even using this stuff right now. Is it everyone? It's probably not. Looking at our site figures, I don't think that's the case. I'd love it if it was, but I don't think so. So who is currently using civic tech? You know, this is an important thing. These figures are from uh, the Google Consumer Barometer, and these figures are actually for Poland. It's important to note that not everyone uses digital. I think in this room, you know, a lot of us were kind of married to our phones, and we get a bit shaky if we've been away from Twitter for a while. Um, but, but not everyone is like that. Um, there are many people in the world that if someone asks a question in the pub, you don't immediately go to Google. Um, you know, 83% of people in Poland uh, would kind of automatically uh, reach for the internet to, to find information. But 
only 60% would automatically use digital to complete a task. You know, if you're talking about the kind of day-to-day -day tasks that people might want to complete, um, if only 60% are automatically thinking online is a solution, then there's a good 40% of people that are not thinking that at all. Older people. Older people are in the minority of users. Again, these are Polish figures. Um, whilst 98, nearly 100% of those people under 25 um, are using the internet for personal purposes, uh, when you talk about the 55 and over, um, that drops to 50%. So you've got 50% of older people here in Poland that aren't just not using civic technology. They're not even using Facebook to keep up with pictures of the grandkids. You know, they're not even using, uh, they're not even using Amazon to get their shopping delivered. Um, there's 50% of older people there that are not even within the sphere of what we'd like to, uh, to call civic tech users. And again, people on lower incomes. I suppose, again, in this room, I'd, we're probably all pretty educated, but we're probably all pretty lucky to, to have access to technology and to know how to use it. Um, but we've got over 50% of people there that aren't using the internet at all, really, for personal purposes, because they're, and these are people on lower incomes. So even just looking at a few figures, we can see that civic tech is obviously not currently going to be a universal solution. You know, we can't just say we've built a great website and expect people to, to run to school or whatever to learn the internet to come onto these civic tech sites. So I'm going to use a quick example here. Uh, I'm going to use an example from fixmystreet.com. Now, I promised my boss Mark. Where's Mark? Hello, give the nice people a wave. Uh, I promised my boss Mark I'd be really nice about my society. Um, sometimes I can be a bit critical. <laughs> I'm going to be nice, I promise. Um, but just as a kind of example of why these kinds of things are important, uh, fixmystreet.com, uh, we run this site in the UK. It's a brilliant site. It's brilliant. Um, it's really easy to use, and basically anyone can go on there, drop a pin in a map, and this sends uh, an email to the local council saying, I, you need to fix a broken street light here. You need to fix a pothole here. There's broken playground equipment here. You can pretty much put any kind of maintenance issue on this map, and it will automatically send it to the right authority, telling them to go and fix it, which is brilliant. I think this is something that could be really useful for everyone. You know, there's disabled people out there that might not be able to kind of access certain areas because of broken paving slabs. Um, there are mothers and children, fathers and children, uh, that might want to use the local playground, um, but the equipment is fixed, is, is broken. Um, so this is something that can pretty, be, pretty much be universal. Um, but we find, looking at our users, that the majority are male. Uh, the majority are over 45 years old. Um, most of them, well, not most of them, but a very large percentage of them are very well educated. 47% have a degree or above. So these are, you know, fairly, fairly homogenous people. And they're very white. 94% uh, of, of users of Fix My Street in the UK are white. Um, that's, you know, why, why should that matter? Well, in the UK, the population average is 13% ethnic minority. So if we've only got 6%, of people from an ethnic origin using Fix My Street, then that's, that's a little bit concerning. We should surely have somewhere around the population average, but we don't. So why does that matter? You know, we've got people using the site, surely that should be enough. It's great having people use the site. We have people say nice things about it. Stuff gets fixed. So what if my ethnic minorities aren't using it? So what if older people aren't using it? Well. I think if civic tech is to be any kind of solution, then it needs to be accessible to all citizens. I think it needs to be relevant to all citizens. I think it needs to be able to help all citizens, regardless of your age or your gender or your skin color. And the problem is, you know, if we've got, if we've got these kind of biases in terms of the people that are using our site, 
then that actually has the potential to manipulate service delivery. You know, we want this site to work for everyone. What we want is for this site to make people's communities better. But if it's only the male, pale, and sale that are using these sites, then that maybe is disadvantaging people elsewhere. It may mean that people who are male, who are white, who are over a certain age, are living in certain areas. That may mean that if those people are the only people or the primary people that are using this site, that might mean that fixes, you know, maintenance issues in areas where there are disadvantaged people or ethnic minority people. It might mean that uh, fixes in those areas aren't happening because these sites are being captured by a kind of pre-existing elite. So that's why I think this is important. It's important to look at the users of civic technology to, to kind of figure out how we can make it better for everyone. Because we need to kind of cross this, we need to bridge this digital divide. Without doing this, civic technology actually has the potential to make things worse, if not better. And I'm just saying, I'm not saying that Fix My Street is actually making things worse. It's absolutely not. It's a fantastic site. But I'm saying this has the potential for that. If we don't use sympathetic design, if we don't use all of the tools in our toolbox, and Sheba was talking about it earlier, using design to make sure that what you're putting out there is absolutely accessible for the people that you're aiming to help. So we need to cross this digital divide. But there's good news. Um, I'm not going to be all doom and gloom. Um, the amazing thing is that people that do use civic tech really believe in it. Uh, people that use civic tech really, really believe that it works. So we did a survey um, in the UK, in the US, um, in South Africa, and in Kenya. And I've just realized that on this slide, it doesn't say which countries <laughs> the pie charts are from. I'm <laughs> I think that was converting it into PDF. Uh, it's PDF's fault. Um, OK, so <laughs> that's embarrassing. Um, I can't actually remember now which ones were the UK, the US, <laughs> South Africa, and Kenya. But I think what you can see here, what we did, we asked these people uh, several questions. But one of the questions we asked was, do you believe that being able to see this information enables you to hold your government to account? And in blue, you know, these are the answers saying yes in full. I think this fully enables me to hold the government to account. Uh, the green, yes, in part. And, you know, I believe in part that this does help us hold the government to account. And obviously no uh, is the sliver in orange. So you can see here that over 90% of people in every single country said that civic tech, at least in part, helps them to hold the government to account. That's really important. You know, that, that demonstrates that once you can get people to the civic tech site, whatever it may be, that it's actually an empowering experience. It's an empowering solution. That's, that's, that's important to, uh, to, to acknowledge that, that people feel that they're being empowered. I have no idea whether these people actually go off and do anything with this information, but it's giving people confidence that they are at least able to do something, that they are at least able to monitor their democracy. And whilst I'm a researcher and I love you know, charts and figures, it's, it's anecdotal evidence that also come, you know, demonstrates that civic tech is doing good. I mean, these are just some of the user feedback um, we've got from our UK sites. Um, we don't actively solicit you know, user feedback. We don't actively go out there and say, please, can you send us an email if you liked it, saying how great our site is. People take it upon themselves uh, to email us and, and say thank you or say how wonderful that they thought the site was and how useful um, it's been, how it's helped. You know, we've even got politicians themselves that have emailed us saying they like the site. And you know, it's them that, the, that these sites are ultimately monitoring and uh, maybe being a bit of a pain in the bum for. So it's, it's great to know that users are feeling empowered. You know, people that are using civic technology are finding it really useful. 
We just need to find a way of bringing everyone with us. We need to find a way of getting those people that are disengaged or disempowered onto these kinds of sites so that they can see the benefit when they're there. So, again, is civic tech a solution? I believe it is. I, th I, think it's a, I think it's a great potential solution. I don't think it's a one-size-fits-all solution right now, but I think it has the potential. The one thing I would say is I think it's a solution that is vulnerable to being co-opted. I think it's a solution that is vulnerable to being monopolized by elites if we are not careful, if we don't keep track of who's using the sites and if we don't try and push the sites out to, to people that aren't in our traditional user base. You know, just like a few hundred years ago, reading and writing uh, were skills that were kind of co-opted and monopolized by people that were already educated and already powerful. Um, I think that civic technology is vulnerable to that. So I think what we need to do is just keep, us, keep asking ourselves hard questions. I think we need to keep monitoring ourselves, not just monitoring governments, not just monitoring politicians. We need to keep monitoring our own biases as well. Um, and I think only then, when we're quite vigilant with ourselves as, as well as other people, um, that civic tech will actually be a real proper solution. So thank you very much. <laughs>